Welcome everyone, it's class time. And today's lessons will be on CSEC music, CSEC English literature, and Cape sociology. I am Janita Arnold, and I'll be leading you through today's music lesson on body percussion. Let's get straight into it. All right, so what is body percussion? What do you know about body percussion? We're going to explore today how we can use our body to make music. No, this is fun, this is fantastic, and you can do it just about anywhere. Whether you're at home, or you're in class, or you're just relaxing on your city or something, you can enjoy body percussion. So let's talk about body percussion and composition. Now let's think about it for a minute. What is composition? What is body percussion? So it says here, body percussion sounds made using different parts of the body. Sounds use, made using different parts of the body. So let's get into it. What parts of the body can you use to make sounds? Snapping with your fingers, stomping with your feet, clapping with your hands, or you can even shake. I'm just kidding, that doesn't give you any sound. But we are going to move while we are using our body to make some music. So let's look at, let's look at music and composition with body percussion. Rhythm, so this is an element of music and we'll be exploring how can we use body, our bodies to create some rhythms. So it says here, what is rhythm? Let's first define rhythm. It may be defined as the pattern or placement of sounds in time and beats in music. So let us move across to this board. So quickly on my board, I have some numbers. Just regular numbers, I have one, three, five, seven, seven. Well, the one is really for pattern one. Two, pattern two, we have three, three, five. Pattern three, we have three, 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 five, five. And our final pattern, we have a nine. So let us quickly, let us quickly go through these patterns. Now we have a three and we have our body. Where on your body could you use to make three sounds. Let us try. Clap, clap, clap. Very good, but we can do something else. What about clap, snap, snap? Clap, pat, pat. Clap, snap, snap. Clap, pat, pat. Very good. We have five, so we need five sounds. One, two, three, four, five. Did that work? Let us do it again. One, two, three, four, five. Now we have a seven. Let's try to work out a seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now can you find other ways of creating your pattern using these same numbers? All right, very good. So we have pattern two. So we have a mixture of numbers. What we're simply doing is that we are using these numbers we're adding sounds and we are making a rhythm. So let's talk about composition, rhythm, and body percussion. So it is very simple. All you are doing is that you are taking some numbers, you are adding some sounds to the numbers, and you are making a pattern which falls on the rhythm. So the first pattern goes like this. Three, five, seven, seven. We're going to try. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Excellent. Let's do it one more time. We're going to put a little tempo on it. So we're going to speed it up a little bit. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Very good. I hope you are enjoying so far. So we have pattern two. So let's look at pattern two. So we have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, 
One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Excellent. Let us quickly look at pattern three. Three, 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 five, and five. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Now we have a nine. Can anybody figure out how we can get a nine? Let's think about it for a minute. So we have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do you notice that we're actually going down? So an easy way that you could compose using body percussion is to create a sequence. You can either come up or you can go down on your body, meaning that you are either clapping to stomping or stomping to clapping. So we're running right down the body. So let's try to get a nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Did that work for you? Let's do it slowly one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. With a little speed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Very good. So we have this lovely pattern and we can put it together and you can do it any way that you choose. So you could use a mixture of three, one, to two, to four. Here's what I'll be doing for you this morning. I am going to be playing some of these patterns and while you are watching, you are going to write down the ones that I'm playing. All right, so do we have a deal? Excellent, so let's go. So while I am playing, you should be writing down. All right? So get a little move in, get a little beat in. So I'm feeling the music, right? Now, I'm hoping you were able to follow me. I am really hoping you were able to follow me. If you weren't, then we'll do it again. All right, so the pattern that I just played for you, I did two bars, just say bars. I did two groups, rather, of pattern two. Then I did one bar or group of pattern one. Then I did two groups of pattern three. Then I ended with nine. All right, were you able to follow me? All right, let's do it one more time before we move to our next activity. So we start with a little movement and we're catching the beat, we're catching the vibes and we're going. So this time we can either come up or we can go down. So any way that you choose, you could create your pattern. So we're composing and all I'm simply doing is that I am taking some numbers, I'm adding some beats, and I'm arranging it in a particular way to make a rhythm. So let us explore one more time. Are you ready? So your instruction at home is that you are going to get your pen, get your paper, and you are going to document which of the patterns I am playing in the order. All right? So we're ready. And we're feeling the beat, we're feeling the vibes, and we're ready to go. And... Now, do you know what I am doing? <laughs> do you know what I am doing? I just mixed it all up, did I? No, there's a word. What did I just do? So I started off with my pattern, but I went off and I started doing other things. What was I doing? Do you know the word? Before I end, I will tell you, but I hope you are just watching 
stay in tune so you can see what we're doing and you are actually learning. So remember what I just did? I started off with a pattern and then I went away and I was doing something totally different. So let's start with the pattern again and then afterwards I will give you the answer. And And we're done. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this activity just as much as I enjoy this activity. And it is super fun, super easy, because all you have to do is just write some numbers down. You have different patterns. So if you want to incorporate two, there are no twos there. You could put a two there. If you want to put a six there, you could just use any number that you want to use. Once you are applying sound using your body, you are actually composing. Now, as I was there and I went away, I started doing something. Remember what I was doing? Yes, I was ad living. right? So I went away. I straight from the pattern that we had on the board and I went into something fantastic. It's fun, it's a living, so it means that you go off and you do as you wish once you stay true to your timing. So talk about timing, we're going to come to body percussion and timing. How important is body percussion and timing? Now we have, now we have one last activity, one last activity for you to look at, and the activity will be displayed on your screen. So I hope you can look at this activity. I hope you could look at this activity, and I hope you will figure out what is there. There it is. Thank you very much. So there is the pattern that you're looking at. I want you to study this pattern carefully, and I also want you to write it down if you have the time quickly copy it down. So you have the pattern there, you're going to start there. It's very easy that you could read what is on your screen and you could also use it to create your own pattern. All right, it's time for a break, but the music resumes when we return. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
Welcome back, students. If you are joining us, I am your CSEC music teacher, Janita Arnold, and today we're learning about body percussion. There is just so much to explore, so much to do, so much that you can learn. So before the break, we were talking about using body percussion to create rhythms. We did look at some interesting terms as well, and I gave you a word. There's another word that I want to give to you, and the word is improvisation, also ad libbing. So I did, give, I did say to you ad libbing before, but I want to give you that other word. So it's called improvisation. And what do we do? We leave the original pattern. We do something else sticking, staying right within that time that we have working with, and you do something fantastic, and then you come back to the original rhythm. So we're in the second part of our lesson, and we're going to even have more fun. So what we'll be doing quickly is that we'll be looking to this board. I have a song to teach you. It's a fantastic song. What do you need to know about this song? This song is from the Zulu tribe all the way in West Africa. And this song was really a song that persons would sing and they would add body percussion just to create some fantastic rhythms to accompany the song. So I'm going to teach you the song. After teaching you the song, I am going to go straight into some body percussion. Then we have some fantastic rhythms to explore. We have music to accompany the rhythms. And of course, we are going to have fun. We're going to shake. We're going to dance. And of course, we're going to definitely make some music using our bodies. So let us look quickly at the words. So here it says, Ma ma li e. Ma ma li e. Can you say it? Ma ma li e. Ma ma li e. It's all ma ma li e, not true. Ma ma li e o. Now you have a o. Ma ma li e. You're all gone back to your e. So let me correct this. I have an A, an I, it should be an A. Ma, ma, li, e, o, ma, ma, li, e. Now here comes the interesting part. Si, bonga, ve, na, ma, ma, li, e. Si, bonga, ve, na, ma, ma, li, e. All right, one more time. Si bonga ve na mama li e. Si bonga ve na mama li e. So of course there's a melody to this song. There's also a rhythm to this song. I'm first going to teach you the rhythm and then of course we're going to look at the melody afterwards. So we're going to use of course body percussion to learn the rhythm. We're going to clap. Then we're going to transfer it to other parts of the body and then we're going to learn the melody afterwards. So let us start. The rhythm goes like this. So go with me. Again, ta 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 ta. One more time, ta 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 ta. Now, if we're counting one, two, three, four, we're not going to be starting immediately on the one. We're going to start a little after the one. So we say one. Did you get that? So it's called syncopation. Syncopation. <laughs> Sorry. So we have mama li e. Mama li e. One more time. Clapping. So we have that twice. Pa 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 pa. Pa 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 pa. No, it changes here. Mama liye. Mama liye. Mama liye. Oh. So, what did we just do? We had a long sound here before moving on to a very short sound. So, let us try to clap. But, how do we sustain this sound in our bodies? We can't sustain the sound, correct? 
So what we'll be doing, we'll be holding it for the duration of the beat and then we'll be moving on to the next beat. So let us try. Did you see that? So we did. Mama lie. Oh, so we held this note a little bit longer and then moving on to the next note. One more time. Now we're ending the entire phrase. So it goes pa 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 pa. One more time. Pa 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 pa. So the next part it changes again. So the next part says si bonga vena mama liye. Si bonga vena mama liye. It resembles this part, but with different words, of course. So let us clap this part. One more time. Last part. One more time. So the words one more time before we go to the melody. Mama liye, mama liye, mama liye, oh mama liye. Si bonga vena, mama liye. Si bonga vena, mama liye. All right, so it's a very interesting song and it's one that you can use to create some fantastic rhythms. So let us start. Mama liye. Mama liye, mama liye, oh mama liye. Si bonga vena, mama liye. Si bonga vena, mama liye. Of course, I'm just saying that for you to catch the rhythm and then we're going to sing it. I'm going to make an attempt at singing this song. All right? Mama liye, mama liye. Mama liye, oh mama li si bonga veina. Mama liye, si bonga veina. Mama liye, one more time. Mama liye, mama liye. Mama liye, oh mama li si bonga veina. Mama liye. Si bonga vena, mama liye. It's a very interesting melody, and I know it will take some time for you to get it, so let us teach this song in parts. We're not going to take it all at once. So the first part says, Mama liye, mama liye. You want to try that at home? Of course, let's do it one more time. Mama liye, mama liye. Second part. Mama liye, oh mama liye. One more time. Mama liye, oh mama liye. Third part. Si bonga vena, mama liye. Si bonga vena, mama liye. One more time with this part. Si bonga vena, mama liye. Si bonga vena. Mama liye from the top and Mama liye, Mama liye, Mama liye, oh Mama li si bonga vena, Mama liye, si bonga vena, Mama liye. Can you hear the instruments in the background? Yes, I can hear them, but no, we're going to add some body percussion. What do you think we could do to this song? How do you think we could use? body percussion to accompany this song. So let us go straight into it. So first we had some patterns, we're going to write them back. We had a pattern of three, five, seven, and nine. So we're going to use these numbers to create a rhythm to go with our little song. So let us use two threes, Then two fives, 
then maybe a seven. Remember that we're composing. So if it does the work, all we have to do is rearrange and do it again. Let's do another pattern. We're going to do five, seven, seven, three, five. So we have two patterns. Now, it might be a little bit challenging for you to be singing and playing your pattern. So what, here's what we're going to do. We're first going to sing the song, then we're going to add our patterns in between. All right? So how do you think we should arrange this piece? Let us start firstly with our pattern, then the song, then we'll go back to our pattern. All right? Here we go. Pattern and and Mama Lie, Mama Lie, Mama Lie, oh Mama Lise Bonga. Mama lie, si bonga veina, mama lie. Here's what we're going to be doing now. Remember I taught you that fantastic word? You remember, remember that word? Mm? All right, so we'll be adding it in. It's ad libbing or improvisation. So what we'll be doing is that we will be improvising over the melody. So you have the rhythm, you notice I have not stopped moving. So you have the melody, you have the rhythms, you have your patterns, you know which part of the body you want to use. So what we're going to do, we're going to have the song, and then of course we're going to have your body percussion accompanying, accompanying, <laughs> sorry. So let us go quickly. And one, two, three, and four, and Mama Lie. Mama lie, mama lie, oh mama lie, bave na, mama lie, si bonga ve na, mama lie, mama lie, mama lie, mama lie, oh mama lie, si bonga ve na, mama lie. All right, you notice that I was kind of mixing it up because to be honest, sometimes you don't always get to put in all the patterns with the numbers that you want. So for instance, there's no pattern there with two, but I did one, two, 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 one, two. One, two. So you could mix up your patterns if you want because what you're doing is that you're improvising and all you're doing is that you're composing, you're having fun, you are making music and you're understanding the concept. So here is our lovely song that we did, Mamalie. We had our patterns that we were using and of course we had our melody and all we did was to put the melody and the song and the whole thing came together beautifully. So you could do it as well at home. You can do it. You can do it as well. So you could find a nice little folk song, Chichibodo, one of those folk songs, and you could create your pattern using body percussion. So there is absolutely no excuse why you are not composing at home or why you're not having fun at home. And for my music teachers watching, Please allow your students to compose using body percussion. It's fun, it's easy, 
and it's something that you could play with and you have lovely ideas that you could get from your students. So we're going to move into our next activity. We have another activity lined up for you and we're going to move straight into that activity. Do you remember this that I showed you on your screen before the break? I want to go right there. Yes, this activity. So what we'll be doing is that we'll be asking you to quickly just take another five seconds, look over the patterns, and this one is instructional. So you have the directions there on your screen. You have A, you have pattern B, you have pattern C, you have pattern D, and it tells you what you should be doing. This one is baby, for the babies, for grown-ups, for just about anybody who wants to enjoy a good music lesson. So the first pattern, A, you have two legs. So it means that you're going to pat on your leg twice. Pat, pat. You have a clap, you have a snap, you have another clap. So let us try this pattern real quickly. So it says, again, pat, pat, clap, snap, snap, clap. No, my snapping is not so strong in my left hand. So what I'll do is that I'll snap twice in my right hand. Is that okay? All right, so let's see if it works. So it's ka, uh, ah, 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 ah. Very good, it worked. Let's do it one more time, a little bit faster. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Did you get it? So let's put a little rhythm into it. And we're going. So it is sta, sta, ha, ta, ta, ta. All right, so what we'll be doing now is moving on to our second rhythm. And this one includes stomping. So it is stomp, stomp, clap. 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 Third rhythm, real quickly. So we have pat, 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 snap, snap, stomp. Again, pat, 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 snap, snap, stomp. Again, and pat, pat, snap, snap, uh, stomp. <laughs> so to our final rhythm, this part is quite interesting. Now there's something on your screen that you might not be familiar with. There's a little squiddly looking thing on your screen. Can everybody see that? There's a sign. What is the meaning of this sign? What do you think is the meaning of this sign? All right, by the end of this lesson, you are going to learn what this sign means. All right, so let's go. By the way, observing what I'll be doing, you will be able to tell the meaning of this sign. So let us start with the pattern. It says snap, stomp, snap, and then what else? There's nothing else. So let's do it one more time. We have snap, stomp, snap. So what do you think this sign means? If when it's time for me to do something, I am absolutely standing, not doing anything. I'm not snapping, I'm not clapping. What do you think it means? It simply means that we are resting. It means that you do absolutely nothing. All right, so we are resting, we are resting. So let's try the pattern with the rest. It says snap, stamp, snap, rest. Snap, stamp, snap, rest. Snap. Thumb, snap, rest. So you are resting. And resting is fun because guess what? After you get tired, you need to rest, right? So let's try the patterns and we're going to mix it up a little bit. So we have two of your patting, then a clap, two snaps, and a clap. So here's our pattern. We're going. One, two, three, and ready. One, Two, three, four. Ta, ta, ka, ah, ah, clap. B and B again. C and D. Shh. <laughs> Did you get that? So you see how fun this is? So when you get to the end, you just don't do anything. All right, it means that we are resting. 
so you don't make no sound. Did you make a sound here? Be fair. If you did, we'll give you another chance to do it from the top. So let's go. We have ta, ah, 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 ah. B and C. Pa, ah, ah, ah. D and Was that fun? Well, I thoroughly enjoy doing this pattern with you and you can create your own pattern as well at home. What you could do is you, you could take the same idea, you could compose. So what you could do, you could have a clap or two claps or two stomps, two snapping, one snapping and the rest, whatever you choose to do. So you're going to make a lot of music after today's lesson. So we have one last fun activity for you to do before we go. We have one last fun activity and this one is with some music. So of course we'll be enjoying ourselves. This one is also instructional. All right, so we have one final pattern to go and I'm going to need some music. I'm gonna need some music for this one. So we're gonna ask for the music to come on now. All right. So this one is fun, so let's get the beat in. Ah, yes, I love this one. Now this one says, test your rhythm. So we're going to test your rhythm, and all we'll be doing is that we'll be following whatever is on the screen, all right? It's fine if you don't get it right, it's okay. All right, so we have a clap, a stomp, a clap, a stomp, a clap, a stomp, easy, not true. One more time. We have a clap, a stomp, a clap, a stomp, a clap, a stomp. <laughs> All right, remember that music is fun. Music is fun, so what you could do at home is that you don't have to do your body percussion without accompaniment. You can do body percussion with accompaniment. All right, second rhythm, and stomp, stomp, clap, stomp, stomp, clap. Thumb, thumb, clap, thumb, thumb, clap. Thumb, thumb, clap, thumb, thumb, clap. You're getting it? Thumb, thumb, clap, thumb, thumb, clap. Final. Clap, 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 thumb, clap, 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 thumb. Clap, 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 thumb, clap, 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 thumb. Very good. I know that you're all ready to explore. All right? So we're going. Take just five seconds to look at your screens, get familiar with the rhythm because we're going, all right? Familiar with the rhythm. And we're going. And clap, stomp, clap, stomp, clap, stomp. Second, stomp, stomp, clap, stomp, stomp, clap. Final, clap, 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 stomp, clap, 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 stomp. All right? <laughs> no. That's a wrap for today, today's lesson. If you have any question about today's class, send them to our Facebook page, Television Jamaica, or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica. Class time continues with CSEC English Literature after the break. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
here again, one, two, three, and go. Welcome back to Class Time. I'm your CSEC English Literature teacher, Vanessa Francis. And today, we'll be looking at thematic development in short stories. Da, da, da. That's it for today's lesson. If you have any questions, send them to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica or use the hashtag TVJ class time. Cape Sociology is up next. It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Welcome back to Class Time. I'm your CSEC English Literature teacher, Vanessa Francis. And today, we'll be looking at thematic development in short stories. Let's begin. So, our objectives for today. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to define the key terms, of course. Then you'll be able to identify themes in selected stories, and you'll also be able to discuss thematic development in the selected stories. These are the stories we'll be focusing on for today. So there's Berry by Langston Hughes. There's Blood Brothers by John Wickham. There's Emma by Carolyn Cole, and there's Man of the House, The Man of the House by Frank O'Connor, and The Two Grandmothers by Olive Senior. So of course, one of the key terms you'll need to define, what is a theme? So a theme, you have various definitions that you'll come across. So one is that it is a universal concept. Another is that it's a central idea or message explored in a work of literature. Another one is that it is sometimes referred to as a thematic concept. Now, you may or may not have heard about a thematic statement. For this, you're looking at a complete sentence or two, and this expresses a theme. Now, remember when you're writing your essays, you need to have a thesis statement. So this thematic, um, statement can actually help you in constructing your thesis statement as well. Now here are some examples of the various themes that you may come across. No, please do not say that this is the only set of themes. These are examples of themes. So if you scroll down your list, you'll notice things like age, things like beauty, things like courage, 
you have disobedience, you have duty, you have escape, you have evil, you have experience. Here are some more. So things like family, fate, guilt, happiness, heroism, identity, individuality, justice, kindness. And here's the last set. Things like love, loyalty, things like power, prejudice. You have revenge, you have temptation, trust, violence, war, wisdom, women in society. So the themes are not limited. As long as there is a central idea coming out through whatever you're reading, then of course there is a theme there. So thematic development now, we need to look at this closely. So basically, it is how the themes are presented by your author. It looks at the techniques the author employs to highlight particular themes as well. And it also is the manner in which the author chooses to address a central concern. So under thematic development, you're not just looking at the theme itself, you're looking at how your author brings the theme out in the work. So how do they develop the themes? One way is through characters and characterization. And if you remember way back when you first started doing literature and you were defining your terms, you remember that a character is a person or thing that plays a role in whatever it is you're reading. So if it's a play or a novel or a story. So the character's qualities, the character's actions, and how the characters respond to situations are the things that may relate to the theme when you look at development through characters and characterization. Now you also have to think about prejudice and discrimination as a theme. So we're linking this now to how the thematic development happens through characters. So take a look at Berry. In Berry, prejudice and discrimination comes out under characters and characterization in the way that Berry is well aware that he's both overworked and underpaid, but he performs his duties nonetheless. So despite what is going on, the metal of his character is tested, but he comes through. So he still does what he's expected to do, even though he's aware that he is being taken advantage of. Also in Berry, he identifies with the crippled children. So remember, they, he works at a home for crippled children and the staff in general are somewhat apathetic towards the children, but he identifies with them. He can connect with them because he sees them the way society sees him, has, as outcasts. So he understands that they are not accepted by general society, just the same way he's not accepted by general society. So he pays special attention to them. He treats them well. In fact, he treats them better than the people who are supposed to be taking care of them. All right, so we're still looking at characters and characterization, but now we're shifting to the two grandmothers. And the theme here we're looking at is still prejudice and discrimination. So the narrator, remember the story is told from the viewpoint of a little girl as she's growing up. And the narrator exhibits prejudice through the story. However, the nature of her prejudice and the object of her prejudice shifts as the story progresses. So in the beginning, she exhibits prejudice towards one particular type of person. And as the story progresses, you see her shifting as she's growing up. Grandma Dell is also exhibiting prejudice again, and she discriminates against the village girls. Remember, there was Pearlie, there was Eulalie, and Ermandine, and these are sisters. Now, she is also critical of Towser, or Grandma Elaine. Remember, she goes by Towser because she doesn't want anyone to know she's a grandmother, so she prefers to be addressed as Towser. And Grandma Dell is very critical of her loose lifestyle. Towser too is critical. She is critical of the narrator's skin tone. 
Remember, the narrator is a mixed child. Her father is of one race, her mother is of another, so she's in between. And Tauza is closer to the white, the fair-skinned, whereas our narrator is not dark-skinned, but she is of darker skin than Grandma Elaine. So the Tauza is also critical of her skin tone, and she's very critical of the texture of her hair as well. And just as how Grandma Adele is critical of her lifestyle, she criticized Grandma Adele's lifestyle too. Now remember, still looking at characters. So responsibility in Man of the House. So in the Man of the House, Flory is 10 years old and he does not need to be told or asked to take care of his mother. He sees that his mother is ill and he works with that. He helps her out in any way he can. So he makes the fire, he makes her breakfast. Not so good at breakfast, but he still makes it. He stays home from school to take care of her. When she tells him to go out and play, he plays near the house because he says he knows that if he strays too far from the house, then he's going to not be able to hear if she needs him. He goes to the bar to get whiskey for her, for her cough. Not because she wants a drink, it's for her cough. That was the remedy that they knew of. And when Minnie Ryan goes to get the doctor after his mother is not feeling any better, she's not improving, then he's the one who makes all the arrangements at the house. He goes and gets the card that they need to show the doctor that they can't pay for his services. He goes and tidies up the house. He says that he knows that the doctor will need a basin with water and clean towels. He does all of that. And this is a child of 10. Now we're going to look at Envy in Blood Brothers. Now remember Blood Brothers is about twins, Paul and Benji. And Paul interprets Benji's adventurous nature as boastfulness. And he sees it as an unspoken insinuation of his own cowardice. So in Blood Brothers, Paul is more or less jealous of his twin brother. His twin brother is very outgoing, he's very fun-loving, he's very adventurous, he's almost fearless. But Paul is almost his opposite. And to Paul, Benji is showing off. And we all know how we feel when we think people are show-off power. So he believes that Benji is showing off, and because of that, he has these deep-seated envy issues. Now... The next way that you can look at thematic development is through characters and characterization continued. But under this, we're looking at character development. So this now takes into account the ways characters change, the lessons that they learn, and this will indicate the themes that are present. So let's look at some examples now. So in Two Grandmothers Again, we can look at the loss of innocence. So you can have innocence as your theme, or you can more specify it to be the loss of innocence. So here, we have our narrator. Remember, we mentioned that she is growing up. Her thoughts are changing. She's undergoing different issues and so on. So as she grows up, her value systems are changing. She no longer admires her ultra-conservative, ultra-religious grandma, Dell. In the beginning, she was in awe of everything that was Grandma Dell. She worshipped Grandma Dell. She liked going to church with Grandma Dell, liked wearing the dresses Grandma Dell made for her and that sort of thing. However, as she lives, as she grows up and she lives more and more around people like her other grandmother, Tauza, she now starts to criticize Grandma Dell instead. So... Once she is criticized for wearing makeup, she used to criticize Tauza for wearing makeup, but we will see through the story's progression that she starts wearing makeup as well. She doesn't admire Grandma Dell anymore. She starts to admire Tauza instead. So these are the things that we look at under her loss of innocence. That innocent admiration she used to have is now gone. Loss of innocence is also shown in Emma. Now, remember in Emma, we have a little girl, Dory. And Dory's mother is Emma. And Dory's father is more or less 
a mystery. We're not sure what is going on with him. But Dory ends up losing her innocence as she learns and begins to see the duplicitous nature of her father and her friend's mother, Mrs. Robinson. These two people end up showing Dory a side of themselves that somehow takes away the whole element of just innocent love and understanding, trusting in people. Still under character development, we look at guilt. And in Man of the House, Flory starts feeling some guilt. So remember, you know, he started out being very responsible. But as the story progresses, things happen and things change. So Flory now feels contrite. He feels guilty after he's coerced into drinking the medicine that should have been given to his mother. He goes off to get this medicine. He meets this little girl and he ends up falling for her little tricks and drinking the medicine with her. And the next thing he's also feeling guilty about, he had promised himself that he would buy a candle. Remember, it's a very Catholic society. So he would have bought a candle to light in the church to the Blessed Virgin for his mother to make her well. Instead, he ended up using that money to buy candy. And he ate the candy with the little girl. So he's feeling guilty about that as well. So as the story progresses, he realizes that the Dooley girl, that's her last name, she only wanted him for the medicine. Them girl are wicked. So the next way you can have thematic development, through relationships. So we're still under characters and characterization, but we're looking at relationships. And there are many, many different types of relationships that you can look at. So you are looking here now at the qualities which work, which the works show, sorry, that are important for strong relationships. Now, keep in mind, even though your focus is on what should make for a strong relationship, you can also look at what makes a relationship weak. So you can look at the good and you can look at the bad. So jealousy and envy again in Blood Brothers. Now, in Blood Brothers, we have Paul who is thinking because we're inside Paul's mind. We're hearing his thoughts about his brother. And we learn that Paul is harboring some deep, deep resentment for his twin brother, not just a brother, his twin brother. And Benji is everything that Paul is not. We discussed that already. So Benji is an outgoing type. He's adventurous. He will make up games and that sort of thing. Paul is more quiet, more reserved. So he is not as active as Benji is. Now here's a quote that sums up this whole idea. The love he bore his brother contending in his heart with his own envy. So you see the conflict coming out. He loves his brother because it's his brother, it's his twin. But at the same time, he almost hates him. Now the next one, Paul's blood surged within him and all the pent up hate and fear and envy, all the accumulated jealousy of the years flooded through him. Right there, you don't need to ask if Paul is envious. You don't need to ask if Paul is jealous. It is there in black and white. So it shows just how deeply he is feeling this envy for his brother. Now we switch gears and look at compassion. So in Barry, you see that Barry is the only member of staff who seems able to empathize with the crippled children. And he knows how it feels to be the one who is the outsider. He knows how it feels to be the one who people set aside, who people mistreat because you're different. And you're different in a way that you can't even control. They're different because they're crippled. They had no control over that. They couldn't make themselves well. They couldn't make themselves whole so that they could walk. However, they are treated a particular way because of it. He is treated differently because he's a black man in a time when, well, it's still going on now as a matter of fact, but it was worse at that time. So he's a black man in a time when segregation was a serious issue to deal with. And 
added to that, he's the only black person on this compound. So it's not as if he has any other allies there. His only allies are these crippled children. So he shows them compassion. He feels for them. He is able to understand that they want to feel wanted and he's the one who's going to do that. Now we're going to look at the parent-child relationship, still under character development. So in Man of the House, we look at the mutual concern that is shown by both Flory and his mother when she's sick. Flory, as we mentioned already, shows her concern by doing things around the house, trying to help her, trying to get the medication that she needs, goes to the bar to buy the whiskey so that maybe that can help her with her cough. But his mother also shows concern for all that he is doing. She's concerned that he has to be cooped up in the house with her. She's concerned that he is not going outside to play because she knows he's just a child. He's just 10 years old, so he should not be carrying this weight on his shoulders. He should be out there doing what a child does, living a child's life. So her concern also comes out for him being concerned about her. Then when he comes back from the dispensary after he has that little incident with Miss Dooley and drinks the medicine, he comes back and he's feeling unwell. And it is his mother who actually shows concern for him. She's the one who feels his brow. She's the one who puts him to bed. She's the one who assures him that things will be all right. So mutual concern by both parties. Now, parent-child relationship in the two grandmothers also brings out these concerns. So notice that the narrator relates the story through conversations with her mother. So for each time she starts talking, it's always mommy, mommy, mommy. Hey, mommy, look, mommy, mommy, did you know? Mommy, can you? So it's always mommy, mommy, mommy. So that tells you that there's some kind of close bond there because she wouldn't want to always be talking to her mother if her mother wasn't always listening. So we can understand that parent-child bond that these two have. They are very close. She feels comfortable telling her mother what is going on and trust me, she tells her everything. What is absent though, and what you can still look at under relationships, is the fact that we don't hear her talking to her father. At no point throughout the story does she say, Daddy, did you know? Or Daddy, can you believe? Or Daddy, nothing at all about Daddy. We only hear her talking about her mother. And there are very few times as well when she actually mentions him. So he is not mentioned very often at all. So then we have to question, what is the nature of that relationship? So you can look at the positive side, which is the relationship with her mother and how close it is. And you can look at the flip side, which is the relationship with her father or lack thereof. So we can also look at this development through dialogue and internal character thoughts. Remember, you know, characterization is what the characters say and do and think because we are sometimes privy to what they're thinking. We also can know what they're thinking based on what the author includes, the narrative point of view that they use. So we can know their thoughts and then we can hear the dialogue that they have with themselves or with another character. So here are some examples of how that comes out. So in Blood Brothers, Paul's mind is conflicted and we understand why. <laughs> He vacillates between love and hatred for his brother, meaning one minute he loves him, the next minute hates him, or sometimes it's love and hate at the same time, warring to see which one of them is going to win out. And we know Paul, very bad man, so we can just imagine that the, the bad man part is winning most of the wars. And look at what is said in the, in the story. Paul hated Benji with a bitter, passionate venom. And with all his heart's fierceness, he hated and despised himself for hating him. So Paul's mind is in need of some psychiatric evaluation because he hates his brother, he loves his brother, and he hates himself for hating his brother because he knows it's wrong. So we continue. 
it was easy for him to love his brother as himself. Paul hugged his secrets close. The germ of his potential love turned to bitter hate. So if you think of that popular line from many songs, it's a thin line between love and hate. That line is called Paul. He's right there in the middle. So we can look at Berry under the same issue. And Dr. Renfield refers to Berry as the darky. And he also calls him a careless black rascal at the point when the accident happens. And he deliberately pays him less than he would pay someone who was white. So the person who was there before him, his predecessor, was paid a certain amount of money. But because Berry comes along and is black, what does Dr. Renfield do? The darky can get less. Now on the flip side, Berry's thoughts about the whites. So he says, the ways of white folks, I mean some white folks, is too much for me. They don't treat me good. And throughout the story, this is supported because we do see where he's mistreated. We're going to go into some more details with that as we go along. But you can look at the character's thoughts from either end. So you look at the negative where the doctor has negative things to say about um, Barry. And you can look at the flip side where Barry also has negative things to say about the whites, which is somewhat unexpected. Prejudice and discrimination in the two grandmothers now. So Tauza tells the narrator, your mother had better start to do something about your hair from now. It's almost as tough as your father's. Now this is something that she says to a child. And this is something that this child is going to internalize. And of course it's going to have some kind of impact on the child as we go along. So the theme is brought out in that expression because now we know how she feels about her granddaughter's hair and we already know how she felt about her skin. Now the narrator's cousin Maureen is not any kinder. She says you're only a goddamn nigger. You don't know any better. You're not fit to play with me. So the prejudice comes out through what these characters say. We do not have to ask if they are prejudiced. It is right there in how they behave towards the narrator and the fact that they behave towards her this way because of her skin color, because of her hair. So now, we're going to look at how we look at thematic development through the plot. So the plot comes in, of course, you have your conflict, your climax, and your resolution. So we think about what in the conflict brings out the theme. Maybe not the conflict itself, maybe the resolution of the conflict will bring out the theme, one or the other. And then we look at the key events in the plot that bring out the theme as well. So we have Barry under prejudice and discrimination. So Barry, his race is what the, is the main issue that comes up when he arrives. And it is cause of concern to Mrs. Osborne. Remember when Barry arrives and she realizes that he's black, the first thing she does is to find Dr. Renfield to let him know that. The new help is here, however, he's black. And she makes a very big deal out of it. Now, it is arguable, and this question is something you can think about. It's arguable that if Barry had been white, then that accident with the child near the end of the story, when the child, when they were taking them to the beach and the child falls out of the wheelchair, it is arguable that if he was white, you know, they would not have fired him. It is arguable that Dr. Renfield would not have reacted the way he did because he fires Barry, he doesn't pay him wages for that period of time. And Barry is not completely at fault because remember, Barry wasn't even there to take care of the children. Barry was there to wash dishes in the kitchen. So how you make the transition from washing dishes in the kitchen to taking care of the children when there are other members of staff who should be doing that? Then of course we have to look at infidelity in Emma. So Dory's father's indiscretions 
you know, he does a little fiddling around, he does a little go around, go around, right? So these are known and suspected or suspected by Emma. We are not sure if she knows for sure. We're given hints that she is aware that he is philandering, but we're not exactly sure if it is a case where she knows for certain. But we do know that there are little hints that she at least suspects something. Now, what happens is that when she's faced with the evidence of it, when she can't deny it anymore, this is what ultimately contributes to her death. So now, still looking at plot, but a different aspect of it. We're looking at the structure now. So the structure takes in the contrast between the beginning and the end. And you can also focus on the ending or the climax in order to determine what themes are present. So if the hero is successful, the hero overcomes, the hero triumphs, then we know what is happening. We know that it's a positive theme, but if the hero loses out, then we know that it's a negative theme. If it's in between, then you can argue either way. So parent-child relationship in the man of the house. When the story starts out, Flory is taking responsibility for his mother. So we saw Flory being a responsible little boy, helping out in any way he could. However, when it ends, poor thing, he succumbs to his immaturity, his childishness. And there, his mother ends up being the one taking responsibility for him, which should be the case because it is the parent who should be responsible for the child, not the other way around. But it's interesting that Flory starts off with such promise, such potential. We are sure that Flory is going to be the one who is going to be the star, going to be the big hero. But in the end, Flory is still just a child. He is still susceptible to childish whims. So, of course, in the end, it turns out that his mother has to take over that role. And, of course, the mutual love is evident in that. Now, in Two Grandmothers, we can see this coming out through love and family relationships. So the story starts with the narrator expressing this great admiration for Grandma Dell and her way of life. We saw her going at length to describe everything that was going on at Grandma Dell's house and how happy she was to be there and how special she felt. She felt like such a wonderful child. But as she's growing, as she's trying to cement her identity and that sort of thing, Grandma Dell's way of life loses its luster. It loses its charm. She no longer feels special being there. She feels annoyed being there. She feels annoyed by everything and everyone. She starts to criticize everything. She starts to criticize the people who she used to be so fascinated with. So as she's growing up, this type of life ends up being distasteful to her and it becomes burdensome. It becomes onerous. Now we can look at how setting contributes to thematic development. So when you think about setting, remember, you're told setting, time, place, atmosphere, mood. So you have to incorporate all of these when you think about setting. Now, setting where thematic development is concerned, you're looking at how society acts, you're looking at the values of the society, you're looking at what is present, what, what makes it good, what makes it evil? So think about prejudice and discrimination in the two grandmothers again. So remember, we're linking it to setting now, though. So in Grandma Dell's rural community, reputation is valued. Nobody wants to have the bad reputation. We hear Grandma Dell talking about these girls who are disgraces all the time. The irony of it, she was a disgrace herself, but we're not talking about that right now. So she, in her community, the church-going people, they value reputation. You also see where in that particular setting, our narrator is praised for her looks. She's fair-skinned in comparison to them. She has tall hair in comparison to them. So these are things that they find appealing. However, Flip the script. 
in Tulsa society, the glamorous metropolitan society. Being conservative is not the way to go. It's not happening, it's not keeping. So in Tulsa society, Grandma Dell would never fit in. The things that Grandma Dell values would never happen in Tulsa society. And having kinky hair, even if it's tall, is not something to be all in awe of. So you see that this child is more or less caught between these two grandmothers, which is what the whole thing is about. The idea of being accepted on one side and not accepted on the other. We can look at prejudice and discrimination in Berry. So Berry, unfortunately, is the only Negro at the home. So he's already a minority for being black, but he's even more of a minority for being the only black at the home. All the other employees, unfortunately now, decide to use him as their personal assistant. Notice it says that Bill Milbury knew they took him for a workhorse, a fool, and a nigger. So he's very much aware that he is doing the work of other people. He's very much aware that they are taking advantage of him. He's very much aware of the fact that they are not being nice to him, they're not treating him fairly. The next thing in, under that is that no one has an issue with it. So everybody is quite fine using Barry. Nobody cares. Somebody is supposed to be watching the children, Barry come do it. Somebody is supposed to be fixing the car, Barry come do it. Barry, 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 Barry. Nobody cares. And as it happens, Barry is accepting of this too, unfortunately. Notice it says that he did everything and didn't look mad. Jobs were too hard to get, and he had been hungry too long in the town. So he accepts this discrimination, he accepts this prejudice, because unfortunately he can't do any better. He needs this job. Now, still on the setting, you look at some settings that are symbolic. So they could represent emotions, they could represent ideas, they could represent people. So you're looking at what theme would come out through that way. And you look at the theme of fear in Blood Brothers as it relates to setting. Now, if you remember in Blood Brothers, Paul has this very traumatic experience. He's such a drama queen. Paul has this traumatic experience of walking one night with his brother and his father and the Cossarinas, the shadows cast by them, they frighten him. And if you remember, at the time, he would have been a young boy. He's 13 now, and it says it happened six or seven years before. So he has been carrying around this image in his mind for six or seven years. So see why I tell you, say, Paul needs some, yes, Paul needs somebody to look at his mind there. So during this incident, Benji, of course, was happy-go-lucky. He was skipping ahead, nothing wrong. But Paul, in this setting, it drove fear into him. So the shadows were like ghosts. He heard whispers. He heard everything. Paul was afraid of his own self, as a matter of fact. So you can also look at the idea of using symbolism and motifs to bring out your themes. So symbols, of course, often relate to themes because a symbol represents something and it can tie into the theme nicely. The motif now is a symbolic image or idea that recurs. So it's something that you hear over and over and over in the story or you see over and over and over in the story. So in Emma, we have the motif of games. We heard frequent references to different games being played and Dory talks about um, the games adults play. So that there, right there is a motif that is running through Emma. And she and Maria have this make-believe game that they play too where they pretend to be Emma as well. So the whole idea of games and people playing games comes out very well in this story. And there's the idea of the little joker, you know, the playing cards and you have the joker in there. The person left holding the joker is the loser. And in the story, what we end up happening is that Emma is the one who dies and has the joker 
right beside her. So right there, it is symbolic of the fact that she has lost, unfortunately. So here's a graphic organizer you can use to help you to um, organize your thoughts. So you could write the names of the stories and then you could have little check boxes and tick off whichever theme you find in the story. This is good for a quick reference as a study guide because you're able to then more or less recall easily. There are 10 stories, you know, so we don't expect you to know offhand all 10. But when you have something like this to use, you can just tick as you read and then you can compare them because remember you're doing a comparative essay of these stories. So you can see which stories had similar themes, even though your questions aren't explicitly thematic, themes come out. So that's it for today's lesson. If you have any questions, please send them to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica or use the hashtag TVJ class time. Cape Sociology is up next. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Georgia Crawford. Alright, so we're just gonna do a quick palm to run through just to make sure that you're familiar again, alright? Alright. Alright, running through palm to palm to ready. Alright, running through after three, two, one, and go. Welcome back Cape students, it is sociology time and we will be continuing last week's topic of culture. I'm your teacher, Georgia Crawford Williams, so let's get started. We have come to the end of another lesson and another week. I hope you have gained from this lesson, but if there's anything you're not clear on, send your questions to Television Jamaica.
Welcome back Cape students, it's a sociology time and we will be continuing last week's topic of culture. I am your teacher, Georgia Crawford Williams, so let's get started. Yes, so last week we started talking about culture in general and I tell you, culture is a part of module one. I keep referring to your syllabus because we are also preparing for exams. So you need to know how you will be examined, yes? If it is that you have not yet gotten an opportunity to look at the syllabus, then where are we at pun? Where are we at pun? You need to go online and download the syllabus. It is free. Right? So we looked at culture, we gave you all the key terms, and so you should know the definition of culture, you should know the different categories of culture, material versus non-material, you should know the characteristics of culture, you should know subculture and the difference between sub and counterculture, you should know the difference between real and ideal culture, you should know what's a cultural universal, and you should also know what a structural universal. These are the key terms. I made mention to you last week that culture is a topic that features the most on your multiple choice exam. Yeah, and of course we are here to pass the exam. And we're not taking a dibby dibby pass. We're not taking a three and a four. We want ones and twos. So we have to ensure that we have all the knowledge necessary. Good. Today we're going to get into the theories of culture. So you know, based on our conversation before, that sociology is in general about the theories, what the theorists have said to us about, you know, their understanding of different elements of society based on their research. Last week, I gave you the definition of culture from Ralph Linton, and I'm giving it to you again. I said, know it. I said, know it verbatim. When you go in the exam and you get a culture essay to write, you start with Ralph Linton definition and you look bright. Yeah, and we want to convince the examiner that we have knowledge. Ralph Linton says the culture of a society is the way of life of its members, the collection of ideas and habits which they learn, share, and transmit from generation to generation. We also say in normative terms, the culture is the norms and values of the society. Good. Now, what are the theories of culture? Be reminded that your exam is called Cape Caribbean Sociology. So whereas sociology is a very general topic where it is researched by persons all across the world, for your particular examination purposes, you want to ensure that you know your Caribbean theories as well. So you're going to know your major perspectives. You're going to know your Durkheims, yeah? And when I say Durkheim, automatically you should be thinking about functionalism because you remember that from when we just start, yeah? So when you're going to know the Durkheims, you're going to know the Marx, you're going to know the child school is, etc. But you want to ensure that you know your Caribbean theorists because it is a Caribbean exam. Now, the theorists of culture, they're trying to explain the Caribbean culture. They want to say to us, okay, fine, this is the reason the norms and values that we share are the way they are right now. This is where it come from. This is what has shaped us. And the first person we're going to look at is a man called George Beckford. George Beckford is actually not just a Caribbean theorist, but a Jamaican theorist. George Beckford was born somewhere in St. Anne and it was well known as a sociologist. If you notice, I've given George Beckford because he's the main person, but I've given some other persons that speak about the plantation society. Persons like Hortswitz, like Best and Levitt. You want to know them name the two? because they're going to come on your multiple choice exam. So when you're writing your essay, you will be speaking about George Beckford. But when it is that you get to the multiple choice exam where they're testing your depth of knowledge and not just analysis, you need to know that the other persons that speak about the plantation society are Hortswitz, Best, and the Levitt. You understand what I'm saying? Good. Now, what does George Beckford say about the plantation society theory? You need to know Beckford's name. You need to know which theorem taught both, yeah? So George Beckford, in explaining the plantation society, makes it, makes it clear that within the Caribbean, right now to this day, he did his first study in 1972. A little bit later on, he improved on it. He wrote the book, uh, Persistent Poverty. And he made it clear that within the Caribbean right now, all the citizens still live in what he calls a plantation society. Just the same societal structure that we had during slavery. As a consequence of that, you find that Caribbean citizens still believe that whites are superior and blacks are inferior. 
He says this is something that started in slavery and even though slavery done decades ago, we still have this view that whites are superior and blacks are inferior. Consequently, the norms and values of the white, the norms and values that are associated with the Caucasians, those are the norms and values which we believe to be correct. As a matter of fact, within the Caribbean, we are forced to accept the norms and values of the whites who are seen as superior, whereas the norms and values of the blacks, the norms and values that are associated with Africa and the Africans, they are stifled. He says, if you look at the Caribbean societies right now, we all speak the language of our Caucasian ancestors, not of the Africans. We speak, for instance, in Jamaica, standard English. If you are colonized by the Spanish, then you speak Spanish, that sort of thing. And that is because you're forced to embrace the language of the whites. He says, when you look at it, those that speak the vernacular, those that speak Patwa, which has a mixture of the black language and the white language. So you have, you know, standard English, which is the European version, but you might drop in a few black words like all kunumuno and things like that. Those persons are frowned upon. And so if you go to an uh, your exam or you go to an interview, you try to speak in standard English. I say to you, if you're being interviewed on television, you try to speak in standard English as well because you believe that the accepted language is standard English. And he says that's because we still live in a plantation society where the norms and values of the whites, the language of the Caucasian English, standard English, is seen as correct and anything else is stifled. And so if you should go to your CXC exam, and you're asked to write an essay. You can't actually write in the vernacular. If you're going to write pato, you put it in quotations. And no matter how correct the information is, then you lose marks because them say your grammar wrong. Because you are being forced to not only learn, but to accept and practice the language of the Caucasians. If you look at religion, Beckford says it is similar. The religion that is practiced in the majority of Caribbean countries is actually Christianity which is the religion of our European ancestors. The religions that, that actually come from Africa, that have any sort of African elements to it, is frowned upon. So Christianity is legal, but Obia is illegal. Because Obia has some of the African religion, they call them pagan, you know, religious practices. And so it is frowned upon. So the things that the Caucasians do, you know, if it is that you are a Christian, you can pray. You can pray, you can have your rituals, yeah? You can have your consecrated olive oil and them can rub it up on you and things like that. Everybody know about that, yeah? And which is fine because it is a Christian ritual. You can pray as a wife. You can say, God, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. And that is seen as fine. But if you buy a little oil or volume, then it's a problem. Yeah, and that is because it is associated with the Africans. If you have a little guard ring, it's a problem. If you have a rosary to protect you, a little Bible in your top pocket, that is fine. But if you ever have on a guard ring, then it's a problem. And George Beckford says that is because we still live in a plantation society where the white norms and values are seen as correct and the black norms and values are seen as in. Correct. And so largely in the Caribbean, our culture is Eurocentric. We still practice the European norms and values. The way we dress is still European. The sort of dance that is accepted is European. If it is that you see the ballet, no matter how sexual the ballet looking you know, up, when it is that you're doing a ballet, you can split, nobody have a problem. You can jump up and spread your legs, you're in your tights, nobody have a problem. But make you start winding your waist and then you jump and split, hey, there goes that. That is because, according to Beckford, we still live in a plantation society. So the key point that Beckford is trying to make is that our culture is European. The norms and values we practice are those of our European ancestors to this day. Why? Because we still live in the plantation structure, the same structure we had during slavery, where the norms and values of the white are seen as superior and they are forced. Note the term forced. It is not that you just accept it. You are forced to accept the norms and values of the white. That is why you find that the norms and values of the blacks 
are illegal. That is why when you get to school, you have to speak standard English, yeah? That is why if you go to a restaurant, they give you the full knife and fork. If you take up your meat now with your hand, people ask about wait, I want go on so. Yeah? That is all a part of the plantation society. Wonderful? Good. And who spoke about the plantation society? George Beckford, main person. Good? All right. We move from George Beckford and we go to the plural society theory. We go to the plural society theory. Now, the plural society theory was given to us by M.G. Smith. He is also a Jamaican. Many persons argue that he is the father of Jamaican sociology. Some persons disagree. But M.G. Smith is a known sociologist within the Caribbean. Now, if you notice, I have M.G. Smith's name as the person who speaks about plural societies in the Caribbean, but I also have Furnival. Because Furnival is a person who first introduced the term plural society, and then M.G. Smith borrow it and expand on it. Now we want to know them things, you know, because when you go on multiple choice exam again, they're going to ask which of the following theorists are associated with the plural society. And then because it's advanced level exam, an examiner know your friend, the answers are going to be one, M.G. Smith, two, Furnival, three, George Beckford, and then A, no, I'm going to say one and two, or one only. And because you only know M.G. Smith, you get it wrong. Yeah? So you need to know that even though M.G. Smith is credited with the theory, the plural society theory within the Caribbean, he actually adopted the term from Furnival. So you need to know Furnival's name as well. And you can't be a sociologist or a student of sociology and you don't know no name. Yeah? You have got feel. And we're not in enough feeling. Are you following what I'm saying? Good? So let's get into what M.G. Smith says. M.G. Smith disagreed with Beckford that there is one culture within the Caribbean that all citizens within a Caribbean country would share. M.G. Smith said nothing no so. Sorry. Instead, M.G. Smith says within the Caribbean, we have various racial groups. And each racial group has its own norms and values. Same say, if you look at the Caribbean, look at a place like called Trinidad that has a large Indian citizenship. Wolipa Indian people live there. They have different norms and values from the blacks that live there, from the Negroes. Instead, the whites have different norms and values. So when you look at the society, if you should look at Jamaica, there is no one culture that all Jamaicans share. Him say, no, no. Instead, you have the Caucasians who are the whites and them have them white norms and values. You have the Indians and them have them Indian norms and values. You have the Chinese, they have their own norms and values. You have the blacks and they have their own norms and values. To the extent that M.G. Smith says that the Caribbean society is heterogeneous. Key term. Caribbean society is heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means that the basic institutions are not shared. So he says we are so plural, we have become heterogeneous so that the basic institutions are not shared. The family is not the same type of family you find with the whites, with the blacks, with the Indians and the Chinese. Different. Education system, not shared. He said the whites have their own school, Indians have their own school, blacks have their own school. Yeah? Well, religion, different. Yeah? Indians are Hindus. You find that overall the whites tend to be Christians, but they might more than likely be Catholic, yeah, or Anglican. Then you find the blacks who are more likely to be Protestant. In say, if you look within the society, the basic institutions are not shared. I remember the first time I went up to AISK, which was years ago, so it might change now. But AISK, when I went there, it was a predominantly white school when I visited, mainly white children. Similarly, if you go to a primary school, especially in a rural area, if you see a white child there, you're wondering what she had to do Because it's a predominantly black school. You call her like, come here little girl, where your mother? Because you wonder, why is she there? Yeah? When last you see a white Pocomina person? Think about it. When last you see a revival service and it's a white person? M.G. Smith says there is a difference in the culture and the cultural practices to the extent that the basic institutions are not shared. Consequently, we live in what is called a plural society, where there is no one culture to which we all ascribe. Instead, each racial group have their own norms 
and values. So there is a plurality of cultures. Now I'm gonna stop for a moment because you're advanced level students and therefore analysis becomes important. When it is that you're going to write your essays now, you need to be able to identify the differences between Beckford and M.G. Smith. Whereas Beckford said there is only one culture, M.G. Smith said there is more than one. Whereas Beckford says that the culture is Eurocentric, so whether you're black, white, brown, or blue, you all have to accept the European culture, M.G. Smith said rubbish. We all have different ancestors and each send down their own norms and values. So the Indians practice something totally different from the whites. And so whereas M.G. Smith will say the culture is heterogeneous, Beckford will say it is not heterogeneous. The opposite of heterogeneous is homogeneous, meaning one culture, all of we have it. Good? Wonderful. Now, M.G. Smith is criticized by one of the boss men, Professor Carl Stone. Notice how I said Professor. Professor Carl Stone, when he was alive, like, was one of the real boss. Yeah, he's from Jamaica as well. He's well known for the stone poles, like him a proper sociologist, like he loved the discipline. And Carl Stone, when it was that he read the M.G. Smith theory and many other theories of culture, he agreed that we do live in a plural society, meaning that there are more than one cultures that exist within one society. However, Carl Stone argues that the plurality of culture does not come from racial groups. Instead, Carl Stone said it comes from social class. So for Carl Stone, it, if, if the belief is that we have not a white culture and a black culture and a Chinese culture. Mm -mm. He said you have an upper class culture and a lower class culture. He said if you look within the Jamaican society, there are distinct differences between the behaviors of the upper class and the lower class. The sort of activities that they participate in, their norms and values, even just the general beliefs about what is right and wrong, how they speak, what they do for pastime is different. Yeah? So he said if you look at our society, there's a lower class culture and upper class culture. What you eat is different. How you eat it is different. How you entertain yourself is different. So when it is that you think about netball, for the most part, it's a lower class entertainment activity. Yeah? You have never really heard of a quote unquote upper class area. You never yet hear say, you know, Beverly Hills Netball Club took on Walgrovians A or took on Tivoli B and you know, you're not in other sports. Because more than likely, there's no Beverly Hills Netball Club. Similarly, there is no lower class golf club either. Because golf is something that is predominantly participated in by the upper class. In say, look, look at simple things, like even how we do partying, all Jamaicans party. But whereas upper class persons will go to a session, lower class persons will go to a dance. I say to you, I remember my first upper class session. I remember that because I grew lower class, yeah? And I am, a, I am a party fan, I'm a dance fan, that sort of thing. So as soon as my mother let me out, I could have started go out, road, yeah? And when I started working, I was working at Red Stripe and it was Christmas and a friend of mine told me that there was this event and she has a big party and we're off ago. Now, you know, when a party big, it big. And when a Christmas, it bigger. You understand? And she said that we have to go. And we got, we got tickets because we were working at Red Stripe. And Red Stripe had sponsored it through one of its, you know, Echelon brands. Yeah? So I'm so excited, you know, because she tell me that she has gone before. The party, the name, Utopia. I still all remember the name. Now, for this party, now, when she told me, I said, all right, I'm going to get my friends and we're all going to go. She said, no, no, and one of them party there. You have to get an invitation for buy a ticket for go. So not anybody can go. I said, all right, you know, we couldn't understand that coming over here about that yet. Yeah, so she said, no, man. And then not only that, you don't know where the party I keep. You have to actually, after you get the ticket, then you go a place and then carry your go there. And I said, well, go there. But still, I'm so excited because a big party and a Christmas and I'm young and happy and, you know, flighty. So I spent the whole day at town. I look close. When I say whole day, there is no arcade when I see my face because at Christmas, I'm here for art. No, I should have gotten the message when she called me at about 10 o'clock and said she had come pick me up. I said, 10 o'clock? I work in a party this, you know, and a Christmas, so party starts so early. She said, no, come at them time here, you have to get the shuttle. 
tell my clothes, I'm going to go, and I'm so excited to be at the party. When I get into the party, first of all, the venue is immaculate, it's pretty. I look at it and I say, we are that far in. You know, that is how I'm looking at it. But then we at the party. I don't know many persons there, apart from the few that I went to Woolmer's with, and they weren't really my friends. You know, you have people who are your school, who are your friend, and then they know, so you know. And you just tell them the hi, like, hi. And then after that, you know, I have nothing else. And them people there, you know, so I see them. I'm going to say hi. And we're done. Then we did, I wait for the party to start. I notice first and foremost that the music is low. So I saw the music is so low. You know, I wait for the cars. When we go dance, I wonder where the box is. I want to feel the music in my heart, a beat. Yeah? So I wonder when the music is going to start. I did that wait because I said, probably an early juggling. So I did that just a bunks, you know? Everybody's talking, everybody's smoking, everybody's enjoying themselves. And I did that wait for the music and the party and the dance to start. It would never start. When it is that, you know, them hear a big tune, them literally lick too blank. Like it just comes up and don't make no sound. Yes, I said, no, wait there. Yeah? And I remember when a particular song came on in my head, I remember it as a song where I said, take off something, fling it on the ground. Now them time to that a big tune, you know? So when the song said, take off something, you know me come, Rrrr. you see when I look at that? Nobody yells, me one out, then me have to drop a key like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, you know, me have to look for my friend and she's dying, cause she's dying with laughter. Me I say, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready cause at almost one o'clock and no girl not climb by the box yet. Nothing now, go, no, I am ready. And that is because how they entertain themselves and they were having a good time. You know, I know that I'm older, I can understand that it was really a good event. But in my head, and for what I was used to, and what it is that I was expecting at the event, it was very different because as Carl Stone says, there is a difference between the upper class culture and the lower class culture. Yeah? No selector now call out nobody. Me said then all the dancers are nice if selector now call you, you know, walk out in a video light. Come on. Video light come and you stop and you go like you know, see him. No man. Not at all, yeah? So they say overall, for Carl Stone, it is true that the culture is plural, but for him, instead of saying there is a white culture and there is a Chinese culture or an Indian culture and a black culture or a Negro culture, he says instead that we live in a society that is plural due to social class. And so there is an upper class culture and there is a lower class culture. Carl Stone said there's no middle class culture. The middle class either act upper class or act lower class. The middle class don't have a real identity as yet. For the most part, they choose one of the, either the lower class or the upper class. Now it is important to note that Carl Stone is different from Beckford because Carl Stone is saying one, that the culture is not homogeneous. There is no one culture that we all share. That's what Beckford said. So Carl Stone and M.G. Smith differ from Beckford because they both believe that there is no one culture that we all share. Because we have to know the analysis you know, and the use of knowledge. Can't just have the knowledge and don't know how to use it. Yeah? But Carl Stone is also different, though similar from M.G. Smith. Right? Though similar, sorry, to M.G. Smith. Carl Stone is similar to M.G. Smith because he believes that there is a plurality of cultures, more than one. Yeah? But he says the plurality is not from racial heritage. Instead, it is from social class. So if you're white and you're rich, you act like rich people. And if you're black and you're rich, guess how you act? Like rich people. And if you're Chinese and you're rich, guess where are you? Golf course, rich people. That's how we see it overall, right? Now, many persons have argued that the actual assessment of culture that is done by Carl Stone is a little bit too simplistic. Because even within the racial, sorry, the social class, you still have racial segmentations. So if it is that you are white Caucasian, there is still a little, uh, sorry, Caucasian rich, there is still a little bit of a difference between the black rich. That's what some person said. But Carston says that there is no evidence of that in his research. In his research, is either rich upper class culture or poor lower class culture. Good? All right. We move along to the Creole society theory, which was given to us by Edward Kamau Brathwaite. You should know Brathwaite as well because he was a wonderful poet as well. Someone in a reading of poetry or not like that again, you know. If I know, you know, if you know the part one tweet, you know, know it. But Kamau Brathwaite had a way with words. But he was also a sociologist. And Brathwaite is from Barbados, yes, Caribbean sociologist as well. 
And he says to us that Caribbean societies are homogeneous. i stopping there, so. Who have we done already that has said that the societies are homogeneous? Think about it. Because if you can't answer that, I mean, you're not learn nothing. Yeah? Come on. So Beckford has, has already said that the Caribbean societies are homogeneous. So here it is, we know that Brathwaite agrees with Beckford, but disagree with Carl Stone and disagree with M.G. Smith. All of a sudden, you can't start writing essay already, you know? Yeah? Because from you have them basic understanding, then you can use the knowledge that you have gained. Yeah? Use of knowledge gear will be marks. Hmm? So just by his assertion, that Caribbean societies are homogeneous. You know already that he disagrees with M.G. Smith and he disagrees with Carl Stone. Now, Brathwaite says, I am not saying that different cultures don't exist within the society. If you look in Jamaica right now, we have Chinese, we have uh, Indians and so forth. And we can say that these things come from the Indians and these things come from the Chinese. But for us to believe that within this society, everybody just stay in their own little corner, that everybody just hold on to their own norms and values and them don't mix up. So that is incorrect. Instead, he says within this society, we have a Creole culture. We have a blended culture that all the citizens of the country share. This blended culture is actually an amalgamation of the norms and values of our various ancestors. So we have some things from the Caucasians, and we have some things from, you know, the blacks, and we have some from the Chinese, and we have some from the Indians, and we put them all together, and it just becomes the Jamaican culture. That is why we have out of many, we are one. Yeah? Since if you look in Jamaica, for instance, we eat curry goat. The use of curry for the most part came from the Indians, yeah? The eating of goat came from the Africans. Nobody don't call it a Indo-African meal. You just say a Jamaican curry goat. It is the blended culture. If you look at the language, the, la the vernacular, the patois that the majority of us speak, it is once again blended the language of the Europeans with some elements of the black language with some elements of you know what the Indians would say and so you find that the culture overall is a blended culture yeah the culture instead is Creole that's why people use the term like all melting pot of cultures Bratwaite says within the society due to acculturation and Interculturation, key terms again. Terms where most come from your exam. Me not ask no question. Look through 10 years of paper, you see it eight times. Acculturation and interculturation, because of those two processes, you find that the culture is creole, is mixed, is blended. Now let's talk about what acculturation is. Acculturation is the means through which a dominant culture or a dominant society force the norms and values on a subordinate or inferior society. So when it was that the Europeans came here and they forced us to accept their norms and values during slavery, during the seasoning process, when we history pick them there, talk to me, during the seasoning process where they forced you now to take on their language and take on their religion, that is called acculturation. So for those of us who have watched Roots, and if you know watch Roots yet, you need to Google it and download it and watch it. That's, you know, you can actually experience something because Roots is a wonderful show. Now, when I was younger, my father used to have cassette, you know, and he'd make me sit down and he'd, he'd video tape, especially when a Black History Month, he'd tape up all of them and you have to sit down and watch Roots. And in Roots, there was the African, this African guy that was brought over by a slave, as a slave, and he needed name Kunta Kinte, that was his right African name. But when he was brought on the plantation, they gave him a new name. They called him Toby. Now, when it is that you just get to a plantation, you go through what's called a seasoning process, where they try to get rid of all your African norms and values and really indoctrinate you into the white norms and values. So when Kunta Kinte came on, they said, what's your name? Kunta Kinte said, my name is Kunta Kinte. That time he had the voice, you know, my name is Kunta Kinte. They said, all right, I think, I know you think that. But from now on, your name Toby. I'm going to him again and say, what's your name? I look upon them. 
My name is Kunta Kinte. Them get the lash. Wop, 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 wop. What's your name? Him say, my name is Kunta Kinte. More licks. Bam, bam. What's your name? My name is Kunta Kinte. Bam, bam. What's your name? Say, all right, lick me again. My name Toby. Don't lick me again. Me say, my name Toby. No. When it is that he accepts that his name is Toby, that is evidence of the acculturation process. Because of acculturation, many of the Negroes accepted the culture of the whites. But when they accepted the norms and the values of the whites, it never took the place of the norms and values that they had. They still held on to many of the things that they believed in. So, for instance, you still plot your hair the same way them used to plot here and Conroe here from Africa because they all on on it. Yeah? And so what happened was that they accepted the white culture and then start mixing it now with the black culture. Another process that they went through was interculturation. Now, interculturation is the voluntary borrowing of norms and values from persons who live in close proximity. So while I'm on the plantation, the white people start live beside the blacks. The planters lived with the slaves. And the slaves used to drink bush tea when they don't feel good. So some of the whites now, them see it and start drink bush tea too. Because you start borrow some of the norms and values because you see them or do it. Nobody not force them. Acculturation is force. Interculturation is where you adopt it because you live in close proximity. Interculturation happen right now. If you're the woman, one person paint, on the avenue, then all of a sudden you see other people on the avenue start paint. Yeah? You just see a neighbor do it and you say, hey, who do that? Oh, your girl looks so nice. Yeah? How oh, oh, that work? That's interculturation. But because we were living in close proximity to Indians and we were living in close proximity to Chinese, etc., you find that the blacks started adopting some of the things that the Chinese and Indians do. The Indians start adopting some of the things that the blacks do. The whites. Many of the white women started tying their hair. Tying your head came from the Africans. Nobody not forced them, but because you live in close proximity, you start adopting the norms and values. Consequently, we found that the culture of the Caribbean societies became mixed and blended. There is one culture that they all share. It is either the Jamaican culture or the Trinidadian culture or the Guyanese culture, but it is a Creole culture mixed, blended. So when you hear the term mixed and blended, automatically you must think about Bratwaite and Creole. Yeah? When you hear terms like syncretic, I mean, I'll tell you what that means now. So you write it down and you go check it out now. Syncretic. Just know that syncretic. Think more synchronized. Yeah? Also associated with the Creole society theory. So the Caribbean theories and culture that we have looked at thus far, George Beckford's Plantation Society, where Beckford said that the culture is largely European or Eurocentric. And it is European or Eurocentric because we are forced to accept the norms and values of the white. Yeah, because we still live in a plantation society. And so there's one European culture that we all share. And then we looked at M.G. Smith. We said, no, no, sir. Mm -mm, that wrong. We live in a plural society because each racial group hold on to them own norms and values. Plural so till we heterogeneous that not even the basic institutions are shared. Then we got to Carl Stone. We say it is true that it is plural, but not plural because of racial heritage, plural instead because of social class. Then we got to the Creole society. We say, hey, you all have it wrong. You are forgetting the impact of the fact that we live close together, of the fact that we went through acculturation, etc. The impact of all that has led to one Creole culture. That Creole culture, that's a blended culture. That's Bratwaite. Now, of course, there's no way you can get an exam that speaks to culture that no asks about globalization. Many persons argue that the theories of culture that we have just looked at are outdated, are obsolete, because of the impact of globalization on culture. So because of things like global trade, you find that our norms and values have differed, have changed over time. So even the things that we eat are no longer just Jamaican or just African in terms of blacks or white. Mm -mm. We eat the things that we're exposed to. I remember the first time my daughter, when she was younger, asked me for pancake for breakfast. Pancake is not seen as a Jamaican breakfast. 
Yeah? Pancake is something where she sip on TV. But because of communication, global communication and global trade, she want pancake. Yes, and so me try find something new. I never even know how to do it. Me have to research it. If it is up to me, come here. So them say it's pancake with syrup. If it's up to me, me buy pure bulk because of the syrup, then me know. Yeah, but then because of global trade, you know, so there is a different type of syrup we eat with pancake. Globalization is changing our culture. Yeah, because of global communication. I am in a class and student instead of laughing say LOL or LOL. Now, it's something for Nina, and instead of laugh, she said, lol. Me, I said, no, sir, this I could have never real. But that's because of global communication. You're exposed to new things. Yeah, everybody, I watch it on YouTube, and I try what they are doing. You're following what I'm saying? Global travel has changed our norms as well. People come, and they expose us to what it is that they are doing. Or you go, and you expose the other countries to what you are doing. And so you find that your culture is no longer just European, like Beckford said, or strictly Indian, you know, or black, like M.G. Smith said, or not, or not just Creole as a, re as a result of our ancestors, but blended now because of what is happening across the world. Many argue that cultural leveling, key term, is taking place. We're in the society now, the world just have one global culture that we all share. That every picnic now I talk about Peppa Pig. Have British accent, Peppa, mommy, yeah? I know, I remember my friend was sending us a message that his daughter start calling him daddy pig. I must say, I know I'm to her now, because I'm a rest man, so I want to know how. Oh. She there, I call me daddy pig, that sort of thing. I must say, but that's because she watch Peppa Pig and everybody get the same accent, yeah? And have it and I talk about it. When it is that we watched Maradona die the other day. Maradona is not Jamaican, but if you're an Argentinian fan like me, you feel it, you remember Maradona, you talk about it like, yo, that sort of thing. Because of the global culture. So you find that because of globalization and the things that it has introduced us to, how you guys just order pizza like how your mother invented it, so you eat it, yeah? Like a fiwi one. That's not something that is Jamaican, yeah? But you do it just the same. So many argue that globalization has really changed culture. And therefore, the theories of culture from the Caribbean are obsolete because they don't look at how globalization is impacting the generation that we live in now. Still, it should be said, and you know that sociology is always a debate, argument for and arguments against, that there are certain things within a culture that will remain distinct. The Jamaican culture, for one, is very unique. The words that we use that have transcended generations, even globalization, don't impact we as much. We are more likely to impact the rest of the world than for the world to impact us. They might use our bad word and like, oh, that is so great. Yeah? So you find that. So, ah, uh, yes, we have come. Yes, we just did a recap. So you know we have come to the end of another lesson. And indeed, another week. I do hope that you have gained from the lesson. But if there's anything that you are not clear on, especially for culture, send your questions to Television Jamaica's Facebook or Instagram page at television underscore Jamaica or use the hashtag TVJ class time. If you want to catch up on what you have missed, catch this week's highlight at 1 p.m. this Saturday right here on TVJ. Be sure to join us again next week for more learning. Until then, stay safe. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.